Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today to talk with my old friend and creative partner, uh, the New Mexican photographer Kirk Giddings. Uh, Kirk's work is much published and much awarded. Um, it covers everything from long essays on Chaco Canyon and other archaeological sites to old churches and maradas in New Mexico to urban landscapes to modern architecture and Route 66 and much, much more. And working together with Kirk on Chaco Body and Chaco Trilogy and a book called The City at the End of the World, Kirk taught me, and thousands of others really, how to see inside the object of the world. So it reveals to us its spiritual simplicity and authentic being. We're here today to talk about New Mexico as a place of power, a place of power in a largely now mythless world, a modern world. Some people think, some people think it's hokey and retro, really, and even romantic to consider New Mexico a sacred place. But there are those of us who know it is, and who feel it, and who have stopped trying to figure out why. So, it's great to have you here with us today in, in the Mercury Library, Kirk. Um, it's great to see you again. It's always great to see you. We've spent uh, a lot of time together over the years and had a lot of great conversations. Wow. And I expect this to be one of them. So let's start today with sort of the present folded into the past and your work on Route 66 and the sort of, I guess, what you've described as the mythological qualities of, of that old road. I think as I get older, my work becomes more autobiographical. And um, Route 66 has been a part of my life since I was an early child because we, part of my uh, childhood we grew up on the West Mesa, Far West Mesa, just a stone throw, actually, a, bu a short bicycle ride um, on my banana bike uh, from, <laughs> my, from my house to a, a trading post on Route 66. So it was a vital part of my youth. And has continued to be as I became an adult and uh, a photographer that traveled around the Southwest. Route 66 was a, a common access point that I used for many, many different trips, many different places that I wanted to photograph, including Chaco Canyon. That was part of the trip out to Chaco Canyon. So in the last couple of years, maybe the last four or five years, I started thinking about Route 66 as an entity, as something more than just something that is a collection of old motels and and uh, parks and and uh, goofy little kitschy um, <laughs> Indian trading posts and such, and started thinking about it in a broader sense in terms of what it means to people who live in the West or people that are traveling through the West as this kind of symbol, both of um, Anglo culture, of car culture, of Western culture, as well as uh, the uh, these caricature presentations of Indian culture and such that, that inhabit um, this, this access way through the West also. So the other night before the big storm, we went and we watched The Lone Ranger. And I got to thinking a lot about Route 66, oddly enough, as I was looking at it. I mean, it is so kitschy. It's so, you know, uh, stereotypical. It's so, but there is a kind of, um, uh, in that movie, the land is still there, and um, and the the humor is, in an odd way, uh, almost deferential. What is the mythological character of that road? I wonder. Well, I remember as a kid watching the TV show Route sixty six. Oh yeah. And encompassed within that was a lot of ideas about the American West, about about freedom, about open country, about about youth culture, about the car culture, um, about this freedom to drive and go uh, wherever you wanted to as a free American. And um, I remember watching this and at the same time remembering living next to uh, one of these trading posts where on holidays they would try to get uh, Indians to come out and dance for the tourists because they knew a lot of cars would be coming through and they would stop if they saw Indians dancing. And at the same time, if they couldn't find any Indians to do it, they would have white guys do it in, in, in brown sh with brown shoe balls <laughs> on, their, on their faces. <laughs> and it was like, it wasn't really, the truth wasn't important at all. It was just a big come on, you right. know, and this kind of fantasy come on to get people to come in and buy things. Um, <laughs> that's, that, I think, is perhaps the, the silly side of Route 66 mythology and history. 
Um, on the other side, it does represent um, an incredible amount of history that you pass through as you drive through Route 66. For, um, tens of thousands of year old history. There are there are uh, Clovis Indian sites that are 13,000 years old along Route 66. There are Clovis, I mean Folsom sites that are, that are 12,000 years old along Route 66. Um, there are incredible um, geologic events that took place um, within the past you know, 50,000 years like Meteor Crater, big meteor impacted right next to Route 66. Of course, Route 66 wasn't there then. But, yes. but if you think about it, <clears throat> In, in the grander sense, and not so much focus on on uh, the cultural uh, cliches that are given to us every day about it, and really look at what you're going through. It's a it's a magnificent passage through history and time and culture. So, in a certain sense, uh, Route 66 reflected and still in some parts does uh, a kind of of uh, fascination with this place, a kind of um, even if it wasn't well well informed fascination, it was there was a a draw, an attraction, a gravity, a magnetism about the whole mix of everything here that sort of became embodied in that in that road. I remember the first time I drove down it in 1958 on my own. Uh, I was I knew that I was somewhere. You know, there was a there there, and uh, and I know that's. That must be what you're trying to capture in these, in these photographs. To me, the least interesting aspect of traveling down Route 66 is the things that most people focus on, which is the old motels and the kitschy kind of um, trading posts and stuff like that along the way. That stuff is, is interesting in a superficial sense to me. Um, but I find much deeper and more meaningful things in the landforms, for instance, that have... Um, deep um, uh, stories and stuff about them um, that we know of from the Native Americans that lived along this area. A good example is Mount Taylor, which shows up in the mythology of three or four Indian tribes um, that has um, on its summit a, a shrine that archaeologists have dated back about 13,000 years. There have been People have been leaving offerings there for some 13,000 years right. from since Clovis time. I think some people refer to it as the uh, the home of lightning oh. is one of the names for it. And you think about that and you think about how much power is in that concept and that kind of mythology as, as, a, as a source story for the culture of your people. And then you have a completely different sense about the landscape that you're driving through. You're driving through um, a place of creation. Your place. You're driving through a place where, where, where cultures were drawn together and formed, and people um, ascribe their beliefs and their hopes and their dreams and their prayers and stuff to these um, to these landforms. When I see that and I know these things and I try to learn as much of this stuff as I can, these uh, hopes and dreams and prayers and stuff that people make related to these landforms. To me, they're like a kind of almost, I don't want to sound silly, but it's kind of like the psychic patina that mm -hmm. is over these things. And I can feel it. It's visceral to me. These things that come alive to me. They're no longer just rocks and trees and streams and stuff. They're actual entities that, that, that contain all of this wonderful history and mythology and stuff of the peoples that have in, inhabited this area. I remember the other day uh, that we were talking about the uh, the improbable uh, readings uh, that we both had of Carlos de Castaneda and, and how we know that this was all necessarily bunk, but, but how th there were terms and there were energies that remained from that experience of reading him. And one of them was places of power. Uh, I think we both feel that New Mexico is, is a place of power. In, in point of fact, a Chinese box of probably thousands of places of power, each within, each within another. One of the things I find really fascinating about the Southwest is a, a, a kind of mental discovery that I made when I was a kid when I, when I realized I was uh, looking down and I saw some pottery shards and I realized that I wasn't the first person to walk there. Yeah. Even though I was in the middle of nowhere, I was actually on a on a hike, um, a Boy Scout hike, um, overnight camping trip. And I realized 
we, we weren't in the middle of nowhere. Somebody else had been here before then. As I got older, I started to, to uh, kind of expand on that sense and realize that not only was I not the first person who walked here, but I was also not the first person um, to contemplate this landscape or to com contemplate this landform. Somebody else stood here before and had thoughts and ideas about some uh, dramatic landform like, like uh, Cabezon, for instance, very dramatic, that has a lot of mythological stories that go along with it. But those were really kind of abstract thoughts until I ran across the writings of Carlos Castaneda when I was in college. Somebody had pointed them out to me. And and I was really, at first, I was really kind of sucked into those and, and thought they were really had something, uh, some really inside knowledge about how the the, uh, the universe worked. Um, and um, I later became much more skeptical of his writings. But nevertheless, he was the first person to talk about in a real way about how certain places in the landscape have power. And you can feel that. You can feel that intrinsically. It's visceral. And it doesn't even have to be an intellectual thing. And the older I get, I realize it's, it's the visceral feeling that is more, actually more important than the intellectual because you don't have to justify the fact that a place feels special. You don't have to intellectualize that and come up with, well, it, feel, it feels special because it looks this way and it's got these forms that remind you of, yeah, blah, blah, blah. it's pretty, it's this, it's that, it's not. No, you can just experience that and know that there's some meaning there. And probably, very likely, you weren't the first person to notice that. And other people, through time, have layered their own ideas and stuff upon these special places. I know that you, like me, have also experienced this in very unlikely places that had no particular, nothing particularly special yeah. about them in terms of the view or, or whatever. But you're, you're walking along and suddenly you're hit by this sense of presence in the landscape. And it's like, wow, what, what, what did I just walk into, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I don't, I spent many decades in my youth trying to figure out what that was. I don't care anymore what it is. I just want to be there and experience it because it's so invigorating. It's so life-affirming. It's like, you know, how the Buddhists talk about being with God, you know, just being with the landscape and being with his presence. It's enough for me. I remember the first time that I went to Chaco Canyon in probably 1960. Um, and I, um, I was a young anthropology student. And, and um, I'd always been disturbed by the sterility of certain aspects of the discipline. Uh, it wasn't particularly interested in what I was interested in, which was that sense of power, uh, of meaning of meaning. I think I think it's it's really that. And of layers of meaning and of layers of interpretation that not only I have experienced but many, many others have in the same place. So when I first got there, I had no idea what was happening, but I could feel palpably different. I felt my energy levels rise to a degree that I'd never felt any place else in the world except possibly the ocean. I felt uh, my my imagination begin to go and begin to move, and I, and I, and I could tell that my, my, my perceptions were much more intense than I, there than they ever had been before in my life. And so when I met you, and you and I went to Chowder Canyon, and we started to think about it together and look at it together, there was a magnification of that, because you were a source of power, you know, for me, you know, and I was playing off that as well. And I remember you telling me, and I'd love you to, I'd love you to tell our audience about this too, about that wonderful, probably the most beautiful uh, archaeological photograph ever made, the one of, of Pueblo Alta with that lightning strike, and what it is to be in a place as an artist and to, and to be there and to wait there and to do whatever you do there for, for something like that to happen. I, too, studied some archaeology when I was an undergraduate and also in, as a graduate student, although my major was always photography. Um, and I was fascinated by the knowledge that it provided me to inform me about the landscape and the people that had been there. I, uh, my life has been greatly enriched by archaeologists. Some of my best friends are archaeologists, some I grew up with. And uh, um, they, have, they have a different way of looking at things in the landscape uh, 
that are uh, human artifacts. But but somehow uh, my interpretive way of looking at things and and feeling way of looking at things versus their scientific way, somehow it all melts together and we get along great and, and we kind of feed off of each other, much like you and I did as a writer and as a, as a photographer. I think my first great re revelation at Chaco, and I spent some, I made some 50 trips to Chaco working on the Chaco body book. Many times I never took a photograph. But I realized in the course of doing that that even in a place like Chaco that is so desolate and so filled with symbols of death and decay and, and uh, societal uh, disintegration and such, in these places that are so overwhelmingly, like a desert also, a desert and sparse little life, all this, in these areas that are so desolate is where I feel the most alive. Mm. Mm -hmm. And part of that, I think, is just history invigorates me. The knowledge of history invigorates me, the knowledge of people that came before. You and I had uh, very similar feelings about the place. You had knowledge, I had knowledge, we shared it, we fed off of each other. It was intellectually stimulating, it was physically stimulating to be out there. Do you remember the uh, the blizzard that we ran into in April? I sure do. Going out on that lookout over Fahad the Butte, remember? I, sure, I, sure I mean, it was unbelievable. It we was. had many experiences like that. Chaco was incredible. Um, but th this was also, the whole period that I worked on Chaco was also the first um, large-scale effort that I did of documenting anything or doing a, doing a series of photographs that had a particular focus and also in working with a large 4 by 5 view camera. Uh, it started at Chaco. My very first large format photograph was yeah. at Chaco and, and so it was a big learning experience to me. One of the things that I found was that if you're patient and if you're present and maybe the present is the most important thing. If you're there and you're aware of what's going on around you and you feel the weather and you feel, um, you know, the wind blowing in from the Chuskas and you see the clouds up over, you know, the mountains in southern Colorado, you start to realize that those are all the sacred mountains to the people of Chaco. Those are the four points. You're within this this, this, this kind of psychic boundary. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it just makes you feel like you're in the center of the earth, right? And, and I'm sure all those spirals that we saw at Chaco um, encapsulated that belief that this was the center, the center of this, this crazy world and stuff that we live in. Yes. So I'm there. I'm always trying to be present. When you go any place and you're present, things happen artistically. Things happen. And I, I like to think that gifts are given to you. Absolutely. I, I was out um, yesterday with a, with a writer that I'm working with on some articles from New Mexico Magazine, and he was remarking about how um, I always, no matter where I go, I have these great clouds. They just follow me around. And I think that's about being present and aware. And these gifts are given you to an artist to make things, the tools that you can work with to make visually strong images. Mm -hmm. So I'm hiking up to to, uh, to Pueblo Alto one day, carrying my equipment. It's about 35 pounds worth of equipment that I, I, I carry. I know that me. is. Heavy yeah. And I'm um, coming up that last escar escarpment. You go up these series of kind of plateaus or ridges until you get to the top where uh, Pueblo Alto is and this thunderstorm is blowing in right over the top of Pueblo Alto and um, I decided and it was lightning there was lightning flashes periodically in the thing lightning is very difficult to capture on film in the daytime uh, because you never know when it's going to happen yeah. so you have to almost anticipate <clears throat> really? you really have to anticipate? well yeah you know, because you don't know when it's going to happen. You click the shutter, and if you waited until you saw the lightning, it'd be too late. You'd never Gosh, get it. Yes. So you have to click it and wait. And so I set up the camera. I composed what I thought would be a good image. And I waited. And when it felt right, I would click the shutter. Oh, my God. And, you know, that is like, seriously? 
seriously, that's exactly what I did. And I shot 12 exposures. And in those 12 exposures, I had lightning on two of them. So I managed to guess right or feel it right yeah. twice. And one of them has the lightning right over Pueblo Alto. And it was just, it's it's something that, that I couldn't have dreamed getting up that morning that I would have come come away with an image like that. But it was one of those days where I was so connected with, with what was happening that it just happened. If you wait long enough, I like to say this, if you wait long enough, light happens. You know, it comes to you. I guess that's what really, uh, a, what a place of power does. Uh, it allows you to be more present than you would normally. Uh, although, you know, if one's trying to work in the world and trying to make sense out of it, one has to cultivate a sense of presence and, and focus and intensity all the time. Uh, um, I know Benito is here, you know, filming us uh, and makes this all possible uh, because of his presence here. Um, but when we're in Chaco, it, um, it's not the same driving up to Chaco, it's not the same leaving, it's not even the same uh, going to Pintado or anything. It's that place in particular. It does, it ramps, ramps something up. And I think, um, the first time that I drove into New Mexico, I, I stopped outside, outside of Gallup at those red bluffs. I was six, 17 years old, certainly not a person who was prone to being moved by landscape. I climbed up, just unbeknownst to me, I just climbed up to the top of them. I looked out and I thought, my God, where have I, where have I been all my life? I should be right here all the rest of my life. And you know, I got back in the car and, drove on into town, but I, and, I, and I remember that over and over and over again. This whole state has that, that capacity to intensify one's consciousness. And certain places in it are just amazingly like that. Uh, truly s spiritual. They have spiritual energy that is, that is uh, uh, humbling uh, and opening at the same time. Um, is... Isn't this true too? I can I can see in a lot of your later photographs, say of old churches and moradas, there's a certain spirituality and certain holiness embedded in those old walls that uh, that I know your camera gives to me. Um, is that is that what you feel? There are so many aspects of New Mexico that have um, spiritual meaning. And you know, I don't want. I am not, actually, surprisingly, I'm not in a, you know, in a particularly religious part of my life right now. What does that mean? Well, that means I'm not practicing any religion right now, and I'm actually a little bit cynical about religion <laughs> these days. Um, <laughs> um, but the spiritual power of the landscape and the place that I live um, is. Is uh, never leaves me. It, I can travel around the state, and so those, so those are separate things: religious uh, feelings and and experiencing the spirituality in a place. One for me is very physical, and the other one's almost a little because it requires a belief system. Um, is is more intellectual. The church yeah. project was very important to me uh, for a number of different reasons. One is that these are, I love architecture and I've always uh, appreciated architecture. And, and at the time when we started working on that, uh, Michael Miller and myself, um, there was a lot of churches that were endangered and really needed a lot of um, uh, monetary support as well as support from individuals to help shore them up and, and, and fix um, a lot of neglected problems with the historic churches. And there's some 600 historic churches in northern New Mexico alone. And so it was a it was a, a task um, that I became very deeply involved in, um, and it was a part of it was something that I really wanted to um, to take on too because it was after Chaco it was like another um, um, aspect of spirituality in New Mexico it was like uh, it seemed like a natural flow to take on something different but even more than that um, I wanted 
there, it was an experiment for me um, religiously, too, because I became a Catholic yeah. uh, during that period. And why did I become a Catholic? Because I had these very deep spiritual feelings about these places that I was going, much like I did at Chaco. Chaco was not a place that I could actually become a member yeah. Yeah. and, and yeah. Um, submerse myself in the mysteries of a given uh, spiritual belief system. Catholicism, I could, and I did. Wow. And it was very powerful, and um, I met all these incredible, deeply spiritual people, simple, humble, working people, um, all throughout northern New Mexico while I was photographing these churches. Um, they were pretty profoundly interesting spiritual people. Oh, my God. They were not just weekend Catholics. Uh, these were people that whole lives were tied up in this belief system. And it, was, and it had deep power and healing and meaning to them. And that, and that meant a lot to me. And, and uh, so I really immersed myself in this and, uh, uh, and learned an awful lot from it. Now, I think m most people would say that, that I probably never became a really good Catholic. I wasn't so much interested in the, in the, in the rules that you had to follow or the you know, different things you were required to believe to do this as I was as experiencing spiritual belief yes. and surrendering myself to some in, in some degree to that, which I had never really done before. And that was very powerful. And I had a lot of really um, memorable, meaningful, deep experiences um, in doing that. Sometimes in churches, historic churches, sometimes alone when I was working on photographs and these things, sometimes when I would go to Mass, um, at very powerful events and stuff in my life. Now, many people wouldn't, would say that I was never a great practicing Catholic. So be it. That wasn't why I was there. I was there to experience it, and, uh, and, it, and it meant a lot to me. And um, every one of those photographs that I made um, are not just documents of a place or a document of, of uh, you know, a spiritual time in my life and this progress and stuff that I went through. I remember I had this show of those photographs at the Silver City Museum, and I like to go to my own exhibits and be anonymous and see what people do. And uh, there was this old Hispanic fellow, probably in his 80s or so, who came in. There was nobody else in the room but me and him when I was watching him. And he went up to every photograph, and he got in very close, and he looked it up and down, and then he'd step back, and he would cross himself. Oh, oh. oh my God. And then he didn't move to the next photograph, oh, and he'd God. stare at it, and he'd look at it, and he'd read the caption, and he'd look at it, and he'd step back, and he'd cross himself. Oh, and I was so proud of those photographs at that moment oh my God. that they could um, that they could uh, allow him that kind of experience from viewing my photographs. Yeah. I thought this th this made this whole project worthwhile. This one of them watching this guy going around and do this, because in many ways that was the way that I felt too. These were holy, sacred places, you know, that people had prayed in. People had died in, people had baptized their children, people had buried their grandparents in these places, you know. They had cried and wept and, and experienced joy and happiness. And there, the, uh, many of the high points and low points of their lives were experienced in these churches. And that never, in my experience, never leaves those spaces. They all just accumulate, accumulate. I talked about this kind of psychic patina that yeah that the landscapes have. Well, it, these churches have the same thing. You can feel it. It's like, you know, you see patina on a rock, you know, it's like kind of this yellowish mineral content. It's the way all those churches are to me, you know. They're just, they're just layers upon layers upon layers upon layers. It's just wonderful. One time after, uh, after one of our, our expeditions to Chaco, I had an opportunity to go to El Valle, the old church there. <clears throat> I can't even remember exactly what the issues were, but there was some problem with getting the key, and I, I managed to, and I went inside, and you know, I'm, I'm an Irish Welshman. Um, my family was Irish Catholic. Uh, I am uh, not. Uh, 
but I could feel it too. And what I, what being in, in that church taught me was that's what really was happening in Chaco. We were in places where that same history of spiritual intensity took place. Those people. Uh, all of life's experiences in the most powerful way possible. Uh, all sanctified by a collective belief, by a community, uh, by a, a spiritual seeking that, that um, is, is beyond words or anything else. So when I first saw, there's one particular photograph of yours of an altar with hands. I don't know where that is actually. Um, um, to Our Lady of Sorrows, um, over by Santa Clara. Over by Santa Clara. Well, I looked at that and I started to think of hands on the walls of, uh, of Chaco and, and many other places. And, uh, and I, I had this, it was a, partly an intellectual thing, but that, but, but that really wasn't it. The big thing was was that I realized that really the old the old basic message of humanism is that we are all human beings. We all feel everything basically the same way, no matter what the lens of culture might be. Uh, and that that's why we're all brothers and sisters. That we have to take care of each other. And, uh, um, so let me ask you just two more questions. I, um, one I think has to do with... with um, with what you said to me a while back, that that in some sense your photographs uh, are telling viewers something that you want them, them above and beyond the images themselves. That I believe you used the word instruct. I'd love you to ramify on that just a little bit. I be I do try and instruct with my photographs, and not um, not in the sense of like. Uh, a classroom kind of situation or uh, from a pulpit or something like that. I just think that um, landscape and architecture and everything that lies upon the landscape, um, oftentimes that which is not seen because it left no visible artifacts, um, is, is important and gives meaning and depth to one's experience. Uh, when you go into the landscape. So, um, with my photographs, I am always trying to show people what they're not seeing. You know, I'm trying to, to uh, I'm photographing a landscape that may be a beautiful landscape, and it's got nice clouds, and it's got great light accenting um, some mountain or whatever. And it's, and it's pretty, or it might be dramatic, or it might be powerful, stormy, or something like that. But I actually never photograph something that doesn't have some relationship to man's experience on this earth in the landscape. I am always photographing, um, I may be photographing a mountain, but what I'm thinking about is uh, the Camino Real that runs in the foreground of that and these generations of people that went up and down the Camino Real, um, uh, you know, uh, colonizing you know, the Indians and the land and stuff in this area and their hopes and dreams and their religious beliefs and, and the incredible hardships and stuff that people went through and the incredible destruction that they wrought on the native cultures yeah. and such um, in the places that they went, you know. Um, and so I'm thinking of all of this when I'm making these photographs. And oftentimes, if I can make a photograph that's powerful and engaging to people, then I can also let them know through titles and captions and stuff like that that there's more there than what you see. And maybe the next time that they go to that place or any other place, they will think beyond the surface beauty um, of, of where they are. And, and, and maybe pursue, um, you know, some history of the place or something like that. You know, I, I'm always talking about how I, I always feel like wherever I am, somebody else has been there before, looking at that same view and, and doing that and, and uh, 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 repeating that same experience that I'm going through. And uh, 
maybe I can make that happen in a more conscious and uh, attentive way for people as they visit different places and stuff in the landscape. I, I get a thrill from it, you know, show people a photograph and then I go, did you know what this place, what happened in this place? Or what mythologies are tied to, the, to that uh, landform, to that mountain? Or, or, you know, what took place here or what took place there? A great example is this image that I've been working on for many, many, many years um, and never found the right light or the right location of the Hokona Hills, which are up by Española. Many people know who they are. They're also, I guess officially, I just found out the other day, is known as Las Barrancas, uh, which is kind of means the cliffs there. Um, many, many years ago when I was working on the church's book, I was riding around with a uh, a historian and a Native American guy from the area, and he told me that that was where the Kachinas lived. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they, the, the people in his um, Pueblo believed, and that's what they told the children, that that's where the Kachinas lived, is in those eroded cliffs up there. Boy, that just got me. And I started then and there trying to get a great photograph of that, of that, uh, the Las Barrancas. And uh, it literally took me until about a year and a half ago. So it was almost some 30, almost, not quite, but some almost 30 years that I worked on trying to get this great photograph of that. And now <clears throat> this this photograph gives me an opportunity to talk about, about uh, what I learned about those cliffs. So they're not just interesting landforms. There's a story behind them, and that makes it come alive. It comes alive to me, and I know in the time that I, since I finished that photograph and been showing it to people, it just lights them up when I tell them the story about it. And they will never look at that landform again the same. And when they come over that rise by the opera in Santa Fe, where you can first see it in your head and up there, and you can see it off in the distance, oh, yeah. you're going to think, that's where the Kachinas live. So in a way, I think... Um, it must be true that if we, if we, if we could look at the world this way, uh, that every place has a story, that everyone has a story, that everyone has a personal culture, that everyone has a series of incredibly important events in their lives that they've attached elaborate and sometimes very simple meanings to, but but always their own and in uh, in the idiosync idiosyncrasies of their own being. We could look at the world that way. We wouldn't be harming it. We wouldn't be tearing it apart. We wouldn't be ruining people's lives just to make money from it. I'm wondering, when you teach uh, your students at the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, you're there, I'm sure, in a number of different um, uh, roles. Uh, you're there as a as a extremely well known architectural photographer. Uh, do you ever get into these kinds of these kinds of matters with the dam? I mean, is it possible to talk about such things? The class that I usually teach in Chicago is on photographing historic architecture. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And <clears throat> many of my students, not all of them, are actually in the historic preservation department. Wow. And they may have little or very limited uh, photographic skills, so they're kind of beginners. I also have fine art students, uh, photographer students, graduate students. I have all kinds of people that take my class. But the largest single block is actually historic preservation students. Oh, yeah. And they are very open oh, sure. to this kind of stuff because yeah. they're they're deeply interested in history and meaning and, and uh, you know, the social ramifications of buildings and the time that they were built and and how they function now and, and such like that. So, so they are probably one of my more responsive uh, student audiences for the kind of ideas that I have about what photography can and can't do. Um, that's been a wonderful experience actually teaching there. Chicago is like this museum of architecture um, that continues to this day with new buildings by Renzo Piano and, and uh, Rem Coolhouse and people like that. You know, it's always uh, a, a really refreshing thing in terms of my architectural interest to go to Chicago. Um, and um, you know, students um, are kind of, the, I don't know, I, they're so open and they're so um, uh, wanting to learn something that's not, 
kind of based in the cynicism that they live in day in and day out, you know, with the, the politics and stuff like that in this country is is uh, mind-numbing, you know, the way that this political system works these days. And uh, so to actually be able to um, get involved in something that has real meaning and, and, and stuff like that, I find students to be incredibly um, open to it and, and, and responsive. So, yeah, it's great. I I hope um, as the years go by, um, I'm getting more and more interested in doing more and more teaching. Um, uh, the older I get, I feel like I have more to say, more to share. You sure share wonder wonderful things with us today. It's been it's been um, it's been really a joy for me to think about um, to think about the world as a um, as a place that could be resacralized simply by by the love of being there, the love of being here. I know you feel that way about it, too. Um, thank you so much. I don't think I've ever had a conversation with you that didn't just stimulate the heck out of me, you know. Um, we, uh, our thinking has been very uh, synchronistic. Yes, it is. That we misspelled in Chuckle Right, 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 we did misspell <laughs> Our thinking has been in sync um, on a lot of these issues for 30 years. How long have we known each other? 30 years. 30 years, yeah. yeah. And um, I enjoy the heck out of this, as I always do. Me too. Whether it's over a cup of coffee or in front of a video camera. It's, <laughs> it was wonderful. It's always great.